Well, here we are. Here we are. You're in the sunny UK. We're in my sitting room. Yes. We thought we'd take advantage of you, and um, we're going to talk. We're going to talk nickel because yep. people have been crying out for it. We're a bit bit late because I think Tom and I have been traveling around the US. Um, but it's quite good that we haven't spoken for a couple of weeks because there's been a bit of a breakthrough, has there not? In yes. In terms of pricing. Yes. So um, I'm beginning to feel like I'm one of those analysts who makes the same call for four years in a row. And once every four years, I'm right. Nailed but it. the <laughs> Exactly. But the drop through $20,000 a ton that I yep. think I've been calling for since the end of January has finally happened. Yep. And, and happened, you know, again, like these things, when they do break, they do mm. tend to break. Uh, decisively, so you know we're down below twenty thousand dollars a ton. We're you know we've been bouncing around you know nineteen nineteen thousand five hundred. You know if you look at where the next support levels on the charts, and then you know in terms of just fundamentally where people's costs are, you know I think over the next two to three months we'll tr you know we could see it trade down all the way to seventeen thousand five hundred eighteen thousand dollars a ton. Yeah. Not for a prolonged period of time, but I think you know we need to sort of really do that to sort of, you know, the bears to say, okay, we won, we knocked the price down, um, yeah. you know, before we start to build a base. And again, still believe that once we get towards year end, you know, we are going to see a pickup in, in uh, demand from the EV sector, you know, and a, as that continued growth, you know, the, the car numbers, and we can talk some more about that in next week's call, you know, you're still seeing 50 to 60% year over year growth. Uh, you know, despite lots of talk of slowdown in the EV market. And as we talked about in last week, last few weeks shows, we've seen a pretty strong rebound. The restocking cycle in stainless steel is starting to occur. So with both of those asserting themselves by year end, you know, I think this is going to be a short lived blip and then we're going to start moving our way back up again in 2024. Right. But how do we interpret this? You talk about, OK, the bears have won. We've got a new base. We can build from there. Yeah. But 1750 to 20,000 where it's been hanging around for a long time. That's that that's cataclysmic is it not? Why yes. is it why is it good for the sector? Yeah. Well again, so the the key the key piece here is uh, again you you want uh, when you've got the bears hanging in the market, you know, if you look at the chart, right? I mean, we've been in this you know either side of $20,000 for most of the last 6 to 8 months as sort of people going back and forth mm. um, there there, you know, the, the two two big things are one again just to shake the bears out because again when you when you want that move higher, what you want is people coming back in to chase the market higher, right? right? Okay. And so you know that's you know that's kind of what we need to see, and I think that's what's going to happen, you know, by the end of the year. The other big thing is you know as we've talked about many times on the show, you know because uh, you know we've seen this massive dislocation in the pricing of intermediates versus the LME nickel price because there wasn't, a, you know, the, the way to clear the market wasn't actually the LME price. Mm. It was the price pricing of these intermediates. And now we're seeing Chinese refinery capacity coming online. The battery guys are basically almost switched entirely now to using MAT and MHP, you know, mm. for a lot of their inputs. And so, you know, what I've been calling sort of this great convergence in terms of, you know, LME prices being relatively lower to where they otherwise would have been. And then the pricing of all these intermediates basically getting, you know, quote, back to sort of more normal normal levels. And, and so I think we're probably now, you know, a year and a half ago saying we're 18 to 24 months away. Yeah. I think we really are now 6 to 12 months. And just what happened in this past week, again, we've seen the sharp drop in the nickel price. Yeah. And we haven't, you know, we've seen the prices of sulfate and we've seen the prices of NPI basically hang flat. So you saw a big compression, you know, in those discounts this week. And again, as, as this sort of squeeze happens here over the next two to three months, I think we'll, you know, climb the rest of that gap and then we'll probably finish closing the rest of that gap off in the first half of next year. Right. So I spoke to a CEO this morning in the nickel game mm -hmm. and he was saying the trouble with this space is, apart from equities prices, yeah. is, is the trouble with this space is analysts just don't get it. Most analysts most of the time uh, researching gold, writing up gold, and then yep. are asked to just, would you mind awfully just fill, you know, filling the, the rest of the day with writing this report on this, on the nickel market, this nickel company, whatever, right? Yep. So is the nickel market different? Should gold investors look at it differently in terms of the cues, the drivers, the variables, which affect pricing and, and, and the ability to kind of run? Yeah, I mean, fundamentally, it's a commodity at the end of the day, supply and demand, you know, that, that doesn't change. But, but what is really fundamentally different is, you know, in, in gold and silver, there's no downstream. You know, what you produce at the mine, yeah. there's a little bit of a downstream, but you're talking yeah. about, you know, several dollars, you know, tens of dollars an ounce to get it refined to a final product right. for whatever intermediate you produce. Yeah. Um, so the downstream is, you know, zero issue at all. Uh, then you get into the base metals like copper and zinc. Mm. You know, again, there are globally negotiated treatment charges and refining charges. 
there's a benchmark price. You just need to decide whether, you know, are you further away than the average smelter? Do you have more impurities than another than other mines would, where you'd mm. have to pay a penalty? But then after that, you know, you've got the downstream price, right. you know, for your intermediate, pro your concentrate product. Even aluminum, there's, you know, people don't cover that much aluminum, but there's a pretty well-defined process. You know, the challenge with nickel, you know, because it's used in stainless steel, alloy steel, and now we've got this big new use in, 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 um, in the, in the uh, alloy steel market is that um, you, you've got a range of different paths to get those products to market. Um, for things like nickel sulfide concentrate, we've effectively, you know, been in an oligopoly mm. for the most of the last 50 years. There's a handful of smelters. They've mm. basically dictated terms to the miners. You know, 30, 40 years ago, it was a way of keeping, Inco would keep new mine supply mm. of the market by making it very punitive. And, and when you looked at mine development in the 60s and 70s, miners would have to build their own processing plants. That was really the only way to get their, mm. you know, get their supply to market. And so, so it just makes nickel a little more complicated and most analysts not being, you know, <laughs> if you had a choice between doing more work, doing less work, yeah. You know, sometimes the analysts prefer to do less work. And so, you know, the nickel, they just sometimes see as a little bit of a black box. Right. Okay. And the, the other quick question which gets sent in a lot is obviously China. China. Yes. Yeah. Mr. Trump's China. Um, is how is the sort of temporary, we have talked about it I think, yeah. a few weeks ago, but this sort of blip, this sort of view that the GDP is under a lot of pressure at the moment, it's a temp it may may or may not be a, a, a temporary thing. I think yeah. the suspicion is that it, it will be. But... The strategics, how do they behave in a market? Like I talked about analysts not being able to yeah. read the market. You know, you, we, we've seen a couple of announcements recently where, where strategics are, 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 are continue to move upstream because they want to secure that supply. How are they reading the nickel market? Do they stop and, and stare and wait? Sadly, yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, you, you have seen, I, I've been surprised by the amount of aggressiveness you've seen from BHP and Wailu over the last three years. Mm. Again, they've hoovered up pretty much every nickel sulfide deposit yeah. that's been around for more than 10 years. And again, you know, sort of uh, uncharacteristically out of cycle, right? In the, what you're seeing in the lithium market right now in yeah. the last 18 months is more characteristic of, of, you know, of what you would normally see in a cycle. 2019, 2020, yeah. Tesla... Car makers should have gone and they, they, they could have bought, you know, half of yeah. half of the lithium market for, you know, one day of trading volume in their stock of the day. Did they do any deals? No, no. Right. How many deals have we seen as when lithium prices were, you know, getting up to $80,000 a ton? Oops. Deal, 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 <laughs> deal, deal. Right. Yeah. So that's generally been their behavior. And so, yeah, yeah you know, right now, I think sort of, the, again, that sort of economic uncertainty um, you know, in, in a big company, people are always make finding reasons why they shouldn't do a deal right now, just in case they might be wrong and get fired. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, so um, I would say when you look, though, at the underlying demand in the EV sector, right, and in and, and the critical mineral space, you know, the, 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 the continued under pinning of, of how much, you know, demand is coming down the pipe yeah. from the EV sector. Again, that, you know, the, the number I threw out there from my trip to Korea the other week that, you know, one Korean battery company yeah. is going to consume, you know, a bunch more nickel than, than the entire United States to uses today in every application. You right. know, and we're going to see a tripling of demand in the U.S., you know, over the next 10 years. That, you know, that theme will continue to go. So, you know, this economic uncertainty caused them some pause, interest rate rise, it gives them some pause. But yeah. once once we kind of get through, you know, the sun comes out again from the clouds, yeah. you know, again, I think they'll be pretty hard at it. And I think you'll see the other mining companies, now that the EV trend has been really well established, mm. you'll see you'll see more interest, more, 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 more mining companies coming into the other battery metals at that Do point you know in time. If, if it wasn't for people, investing would be easy. Yeah, exactly. But honestly, I have, <laughs> don't you think? But this, but this underscores the, you know, if you're willing to take a long-term view, if you're willing to not go where the herd is charging off, mm. you know, if you're, if you're buying when people are selling and yeah. you're not doing anything, and if you're selling when, you know, people are charging into the space, you know, you, you can, again, you don't have to get it right, but if you get it mostly right, you can, you can make a lot of money, so... Yeah, so it's a bit of backtrack that so we do need the volatility. But but it's it's funny though, isn't it? It's not just retail that kind of get nervous and or or are driven by sentiment. It's funds where when they're seeing redemptions come in, they get nervous. 
analysts get nervous, the strategists get nervous. Everyone gets nervous yeah. about this volatility, but the general trend is up. That, that's what we've got to acknowledge in terms of the demand numbers, right? Yep, 100%. Okay, so yep. what we're saying is you can, you, can, you can play that ride. Enjoy the ride, folks. Yeah. Um, okay, so for, first we can see, um, you, would, would you, you reckon, what did you say, six, six months or so, six to nine months? Of. In terms of timing for when we see this steady accretive growth around price. Oh, it should be towards the end of the year. I, th okay. I think we'll bottom Straight out. Up. This is going to be sort Straight of a up. three month window of pain. Okay. Um, you know, we, you know we, we will start to move higher again early in the new year. And then, you know, I could see us back into these $20,000 ton levels by next spring with, with right. a lot more momentum behind it to okay. take it up to the next that's level. That's what we're looking so at, folks. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Buy now, buy cheap. Yep. Okay, yep. Buy, buy sensibly. Yep. Um, should we talk about a few companies? Yeah, there's, yeah, few so companies. there's some good news in the last few weeks. There's some good news, hopefully more to come as well. Yeah. Uh, let's start with FPX yep. on news. What, what, what do we need, need to remember there? No, good deal there. So um, it's, it's a non-binding MOU, um, but having done deals with a lot of Asian companies, you know, it, that, you know that would have been probably 12 to 18 months, six yeah. to eight trips. Um, you know, to, to get to that point. And, and again, it just underscoring, you know, these big ultra mafix, you know, that are long life, lots of production, that's what these battery guys want. So not mm. surprisingly, um, FPX had a relationship with Jogmec, who's the, the Japanese exploration company, mm. you know, in building off these Japanese relationships, they've now signed a deal, um, you know, with, with Toyota mm. and the Toyota battery joint venture, you know, to look at basically developing, you know, uh, getting involved in the mine and then looking also at the downstream supply chain. Because again, you know, we not only need new mines, but if, if that nickel is going to end up in a battery plant in North America, you, you, that next stage process yeah. also happens there. So again, great deal for Martin. Very happy yeah. with the FPX team to see that see that one get over the well, line. Jogmac, busy, busy, busy. I was talking to another group where they've just piled into as well. So um, yeah, I, I think people like, I say these strategics, not necessarily rushing in, but they are positioning themselves for success. Yeah. Um, now, now, with the the other one I, talk, I want to talk about, as I think we spoke some last week as well, is Giga Metals. They've also yeah. been in the news. So, so that's good. So, I mean, what's been great over the last you know two or three weeks here for us is is there's been a you know whole range of uh, you know PEAs PFS mm. has come out. So Giga uh, put out a PFS on their um, deposit uh, in in uh, northern uh, BC. It was a 11% after tax IRR on a 21,500 nickel price and a 58,000 uh, dollar cobalt price. Yeah, yeah. Looking for a capex of about 1.9 billion okay. uh, for about 90,000 tons of ore a day, and they'll produce about 35,000 tons of nickel and a couple thousand tons of cobalt. The nickel-cobalt ratio there, there's you know you get proportionally a lot more cobalt than you typically do yeah. for most nickel deposits with them. So that cobalt uh, is an important number. Okay. Uh, I think one of the key takeaways, which is kind of some, you know when you look through the table there, you see the pre-tax IRR and then you see the post-tax. You normally yeah. see okay, you know a third, a third of the value, a third of the value going to the government. Yeah. You know, but in this case, it's the same. And and again, this is something we talked about on some of their shows. Investors don't realize just how valuable this critical minerals tax credit that the mm. Canadian federal government, you know, put in place. We're getting thirty percent of our capital back. Yeah. You know, so you know, effectively, you know, this, you know, it looks like that mine is now sitting in a tax haven because the yeah. after tax returns, you know, that's how big yeah. a number, you know, that the, the government's going to yeah. be providing in a cash tax credit back to these these mines in Canada that are positioned to take take it. You know, take advantage of. Uh, okay. Yeah. So, so, th so that's one. That's one critical thing to look at is obviously the, the tax position there, yeah. or tax credit position there. The other aspects of this, which I think people need to understand about large-scale, multi-decade projects, is well, one thing is multi-decade. Yeah. Why? Why that's important. So, do you want to deal with that? Yes. Yeah, so, so again, so the key is, that. you know, if you've got uh, why, why multi-decade is good. And, and having that scale of resource, there's, there's two good reasons. One is, you know, you, it gives you the multiple cycles to get it right. When you have a, you know, eight to 10 year mine life, yeah. you know, again, you've, you're, you're, doing, you're developing these mines against the backdrop of a commodity price that, that is highly yeah. variable. And so if you, you know, if you bugger up the first cycle because you just time it wrong, you know, then that really, you don't have much chance to get mm. caught up. So having multiple cycles to generate that return is, is mm. super helpful. The other piece is the embedded optionality of, okay, you know, if the market turns out to be wildly better than, than I'm expecting, right. then I can add an expansion, right, and derive a whole, you know, pile more value from that. So, you well, know, those, those options, people pay money for options, right? And so, you know, these are real options that are embedded in a yeah. long life asset. So, 
you know, that, that's why you see the Japanese companies and so forth going after these multi-decade assets. Right, and I guess I will say somewhere in there, you, you get the occasional super cycle pop along yep. and pays off your debt. Yes, <laughs> you yeah, know, yeah. You know, and, 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 and those things can happen. They don't last long, but when they do, you, you make hay, right? Yep, oh no, exactly. I mean, a good example of this, you know, Inco in the early, in the mid 90s, bought Boise's Bay, the totally overpaid, yeah. you know, by probably a couple billion dollars yeah. at the time. But because they had that asset, it was a longer life asset. And so, you know, they were able to develop that asset in time to hit that new nickel super cycle. And I think they may have actually <laughs> got their, you know, re re actually earned a decent return on capital on the overall investment, yeah. um, you know, by the time, uh, you know, because of that, you know, being able to hit that super cycle. Uh, so, abso absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah. so that, that's the benefit of having multi-decade projects. So the, yeah. the, the, the longer the better, your sunk costs are up, up, up front and then you're, you're operating and sustaining capital is well. Then you got to work. At hopefully, making money along the way there. Yeah. Too. When I when I when I first looked at those headlines, I was looking, man, eleven percent. You don't want too many mistakes in there. So yes, I guess the multi-decade bit answers a bit of that. Yeah. But and we talked about it on other shows as well. It's not too bad. Double digits is not too bad. Yeah. Love it to be more. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Low, low double digits is, is, is no, I should say that, you know, getting 11% is not bad, but I would say you want a bit more, you want a bit more, but can it be, can it, is it economic? Yeah, and I think the key piece, like for most, you know, multi-decade base metal assets, mid-teens IRR, again, yeah. a good friend of mine worked for one of the top advisory firms, you know, for a very long time, and yeah, and that's, you know, if you're building something in Chile and Peru and it's multi-decade in a safe jurisdiction, yeah, you're going to see 13 to 15% IRRs typically, yeah. you know, typically on average. You know, I, I think there with Giga, yeah, I mean, it's not in that mid-teens IRR range, but I think the thing that it has going for it is, you know, it's not like, it's not like in copper where there's, you know, 45 projects, you know, at a PEA, PFS, FS stage around the world you know, mm. that they're competing for attention for, you know, they still are only, a, you know, one of a handful of projects mm. that could, you know, come to market, you know, mm. by the early 2030s. And so, you know, you know, people don't have a view on today's nickel price, you know, in terms of where it's sitting. And again, if you go back to nickel pre-China, you know, we used to have mm. raging debates whether the long-term price of nickel was $3 yep. or 325 a pound, yep. you know, five years, Four years after that, and, and and nickel prices had spiked to twenty. All of a sudden, people's long-term price expectations were six yeah. or seven dollars. And it's like, yeah. oh, would you like to buy an asset? Yeah. You know, at three dollars. So, you know, I think again, if if you if you're bullish on nickel, even even with those kind of returns, you should think about it as a you know basically an out of the you know out of the money option right now that could generate. If you're really if you have a very bullish view on on where nickel could go, you know, then that's something that could, you know could dramatically re-rate if we get that kind of you know four years from now right. get another step up in in what people's you know short you know, medium to long term views of, of the nickel price are. Right. So and, and this comes back kind of full circle to what we were saying about analysts earlier. They're, they're, when we again we keep talking about these things, yeah, they're cautious creatures. Well, whack it up another three percent this year. Yeah. Not going to get fired if I do that. Yeah. But I'm also not going to bother looking at the data around demands because. I don't necessarily believe it or understand this, and yep. that's fine. So the assumptions here that Mark has used, I think um, 9.75 yep. on on the nickel, 58 on the on the cobalt. On the, on the cobalt. Yep. Both seem like wow. Why could you do that? Today is what 8.60 this morning on nickel. Yeah, cobalt's a ways off of that. So is that reasonable? No, I think you know most most. If you look at most of the mining projects, you've basically you know done the last. Because again, we've had half a dozen studies done. Yeah. You're basically anywhere from kind of eight seventy-five to eleven dollars a pound. You know, right. we'll probably end up using slightly less than than he did, but yeah. but you know, in in that in that nine to nine fifty range. Right. Um, and why, and so, why, but to answer the question, the question is, why is that a reasonable thing to do? Again, if you look at where the cost curve is today, and then, again, you know, you need to get a third party view on the market. And so, you know, generally, the, if you look at the ninetieth percentile of a cost curve, yeah, that's generally you know where where the um, long-term price tends tends to sit, and right. so you know because we've seen you know grades decrease on laterite operations, yeah. coal costs go up. Yeah. You know that's that's really kind of shifted that that second half of the cost curve higher. Right. Um, and so yeah, no, I'm I mean I, again I think you know when the number we're going to use in the feasibility study is going to be a number that you know I can you know, hand on heart say yeah that's a reasonable right. number for the long term. Do I believe? 
you know, it could be 10 or $11 a pound. Yeah, for sure. But I, you know, I don't, I wouldn't want to put that in a study today. Right. Okay. Yeah. And, um, and d does the market accept that? Do, if you go into your, your institutional guys and you kind of pop up with a 975 or, or there, there or thereabouts, yeah. there you go. Yeah, Mark, that's absolutely reasonable. Do they know? Uh, the, again, they're influenced by where the price has been. So, you know, again, we've last three years now, we've been trading sort of north of that number, right? right. So that that's helpful. And then again, they would, they would have a sense of generally where the cost curve is, right? right. So, you know, they would, they would, and it, you know, again, where people are in generally using a project number, the only time is when you see an outlet like, like Chalice where $11 a pound, like, you know, where yeah. the heck did that number come from, right? You know, so I've got an answer. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. We might be sitting on it, but um, yeah. the um, that is, you know, that, they, that that's the part where panelists, you know, really shake their head and go, okay, you know, if that's so aggressive, you know, what else have you yeah. hidden in your feasibility study? Yeah. The, the other three hundred assumptions yeah. that, that people yeah. don't see yeah. or don't understand, you know, where you know where 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 else could you be, you know, really really aggressive? <clears throat> okay, so and like, like I, I, I said, I, I spoke to Mark and he put down some you know, good cases and stated. And he's basically saying, like, the strategies get where we're at, right? They get what we're trying to do. The yep. things that are important, he says, and you, you can tell yep, us what's sure. important for you, is around the, the, the network. Yeah. He said, right, okay, what are, what are we actually going to be able to recover? What will the payables actually be? Yeah. Quite frankly, whose balance sheet is actually going to be doing all of the heavy lifting here? Yep. And, you know, what does that mean for retail shareholders and other shareholders of his company, including himself? Right. Um, for the to short to medium term before you, because where, where are they? They're at a, they're at a PEA stage? Uh, that, PFS. That was, that was their PFS, yep. their PFS stage, of course it was. Um, they've got to kind of get through to that, you know, final investment decision. And that's yep. going to take, he reckons for him, 50 million bucks. Yep. Where's he going to get that from as a $25 million company, right? Yep. That, was the, that was a really interesting conversation. And he yep. does, puts a good case forward for, for why that, why, why that is, um, will happen yep. in a non-dilutory way for shareholders. Yep. For you guys, you're about to put it, a, you're slightly ahead of that, well, quite a bit ahead of them, actually. Yeah. Uh, feasibility study, you've done that in four years. Yep. Really kind of race through the phases there. Yep. Helps with the kind of, I guess, the Enco Falcon Bridge background. But yep. um, what is important for your current shareholders to understand about the way these things get built? What's important for people looking into buy this? What's important for the strategic partners that you've got and the strategic partners you'll bring in? Yeah, yeah. So I mean, again, you know, the miners, big miners and big off takers. You know, what they want. You know, again, Mark's exactly right. You know, where's the risk, right? And so, you know, what, you know, what's the, what's the recovery and what's the amount of work that we're doing? That's mm. why we work with the Senko because they're the you know leading guys in terms of sulfide mills. Yeah. In terms of you know fully understanding you know how that's going to work. Um, I think that's quite interesting because you're not paying them. And like a lot of companies, sorry, we haven't done what, if you, if you, been involved for years. Yeah. You kind of pay these guys to say what you want them to say. Typically, yeah. these guys are telling you what's actually going to happen, what the economics actually are. These are real yeah, people. They, Senko are the best. Yeah, they've got a reputation for yeah. delivering mills that actually, you know, get built yeah. on time on budget yeah. and ramp up in many cases above, you know, what the design capacity is. And again, if you're actually going to build it, yeah. that's, you know, that's what you want to see. So that having them involved is, is helpful for us mm. with a range of, you know, strategics uh, and mining companies. Again, you know, the safe jurisdiction, right? So if you're going to drop a couple, because again, big projects, you know, are, you know, the ca capital number starts with a B. Mm. And so, you know, part of the reason people are willing to trade off mid-teens IRR versus a north of 20% IRR in a high-risk country with a small high-grade deposit, yeah. you know, is because, you know, the risk of it being confiscated economically or physically yeah. is zero in a place like in, in, a, in a place like Canada. And then you, again, you've, you've developed a multi-decade resource, which gives them mm. all kinds of optionality that's embedded in, it doesn't show up in an IRR calculation, yeah, yeah. but is, d d is a real source of value in terms of you know, how the project moved forward. So you know, again, for us, we're days away from having our feasibility okay. study, study out here. Okay. And again, you know, to remind people, you know, where we are versus PEA, and and this is, you know, you know, what we've been telling the street, you know, we're going to double, you know, the the, the scale of the mine plant from where we were in, right. in the PEA, and it was already a 25-year mine life, you know, and one of the you know five largest nickel mines uh, in the world. Okay. We've you know talked about the significant nickel recovery improvements and basically the nickel, the iron, and the chrome, mm. you know, and again, you know, if if we weren't going to see those, we would have you know, told you about that. But, mm. you know, we're very confident, you know, as we're getting the final days here, you know, that, you know, we've made those step changes okay. in terms of improvement. 
the IPT carbonation, right? We're not only a nickel cobalt mine, but we're going to be the you know one of the largest carbon storage facilities yep. in Canada in an environment where people care about that. You know the economics of that are going to be embedded. So again, we get two tax credits. We not only get the critical minerals credit, yep. but we're you know pretty sure that yes, you know, have to apply for it. But you know based on the work that we've done, we're pretty confident that we're going to get the carbon capture and storage okay. tax credit as well okay. um, from the you know the, the yeah, Canadian government. And so. You know, as I said, we've done this in four years from the fifth drill hole, yeah. you know, with a tribute to the team, uh, the experience yeah. uh, that we've got. And, you know, the other part in terms of being out in front, like, you know, again, you know, we've already spent that $50 million, right? You know, that's that's behind us at this yeah. point. Yeah. You know, now we're talking to the off takers. Now we're talking to the strategics. Yeah. And again, as the only big project that's already through the first stage of the federal permitting process in Canada, the other ones haven't even started yet. Right. You know, you know, we, we are years and years away in a market where people are desperate for nickel by the latter part of this decade. And so, you know, as we kick off the, the process with Scotia and Deutsche Bank, you know, shortly after the feasibility study comes out, you know, the, the I would say the urgency with which a number of the battery supply chain guys, you know, are, are keen mm. <laughs> to get supply sooner than later, you know, is, is, is plain to us because we, we are literally, the, you know, the, the horse that's, that's right out in front right now. So the, so the numbers that you're going, you're days away, okay, yeah. so that, that's interesting and that's good news indeed. It, they will not include the carbon capture, a store, ca capture storage numbers, but they've done the work, which will show you that, which will allow you to apply for it. Yeah. So the numbers will be even better than the ones you're about to uh, yeah. show the market. So the base case will have the critical minerals tax credit in there. Right. Okay. You know, the base again, case, right. Okay. Haven't seen the final. The government has put out the final regulations yet, but right. everyone, you know, FPX did. Yeah. It did. You know, we feel confident enough to know where that's going to land. You know, that we can state our assumptions on that one. Okay. The carbon capture and storage, we still need to do it. So we'll put that as a chapter 24 opportunity. Okay. We'll have an assessment of what, you know, that tax credit could be worth. So that'll be, you know, a, a number that'll yeah be on top in terms of the NPV and IRR. And okay. again, we're not talking about tens of millions of dollars of additional tax credit. We're talking about, you know, $100 million plus of additional tax credit on top of what we're already getting okay. from the critical minerals credit. So it's, it's very meaningful. Very, very meaningful. Yeah. Okay, well, I look forward to that. No, me too. <laughs> I look forward yeah. to that. Yeah. Because you're about to, I want to talk to you about, sorry, um, nickel sulfide index in a yes. second. Yeah. Okay, because I thought that was someone sent in that, and I think it's a really interesting one. Yeah. But um, you're off now as part of a Canadian delegation. Yes. To talk to the UK government and the French government. Yeah about critical minerals in Canada. What's yes. that? Tell us about that. Yeah, so we're meeting with, we basically there's an entire government delegation from yeah. Canada over here. Uh, we're gonna be meeting with investors and, and, and the governments here in the UK, government yeah. officials from the UK yeah. and, and France. Again, every country in the West, you know, realizes that the supply chain for all these minerals is dominated by China, you know, and or, you know, uh, supply from countries that might have environmental issues, labor issues, whatever. Mm. So, uh, you know, again, everyone's very keen to get access to, quote, you know, safe supply. And so, mm. yep, so basically tomorrow will be all day here in London and then take the train over and then we've got all day in, in Paris. And so, again, I think investors should, should take note of the fact that, you know, government people are generally always pretty busy. Yeah. You know, the fact that they're taking their time out to help yeah. promote, you know, some of the projects in the country should be a clear sign that, yeah. you know, they, they really want these things to happen. So it's, it's funny, though, like Trudeau's getting absolutely kicking in the press at the moment. Yeah. Globally. Yes. Yes. Globally. Yeah. Is because he's um, falling out with India. But they, he ha they have, Canada has actually put its money where its mouth is and is not just helping Canadian companies, but you know, the, with the tax credits and incentives and funding, it really, it really is taking a leading position. This is, you know, I've said that before. This is a once in a generation opportunity to develop projects in North America because, again, the U.S. government has put their money where their mouth is as well. Mm. And again, <laughs> better chance of actually developing a mine on the Canadian side of the border yeah. than on the U.S. Yeah. And so you've got this, you know, at the end of the day, what really matters is return on equity, right? Yeah. And if all of a sudden people are going to give you a bunch of free equity yeah. with which, you know, it's basically like having a zero cost, you yeah. know, zero cost leverage, which, yeah. you know, any, any, any financial person should be jumping up and down to get a piece of. And we've got that opportunity with what the assets we have in Canada Nickel and other companies like FBX and Giga and yeah. so forth have yeah. in the Canadian market. And this is a, a five to 10 year window that, uh, super you know, cycle. really create some real value. So I know we're, we're banging yeah. on about super cycles now. Yeah, and I think the interesting thing is why we know 
people are interested is because we've got people coming from outside of natural resource investing. We've got all of these tech guys, we've got all of these industrial guys, we've got all of these, you know, re re retail, high street retail brand guys and gals coming in. And they're going, what is this metal super cycle people are talking about? How do, is it now? When does it happen? Right. How do I make more important? How do I make money? Yeah. Right? Yeah. And so we've been talking so specifically about nickel, occasionally about copper, um, in terms of the supply demand um, features and how it works and how, what the, the geopolitical um, you know, machinations of it are. But people are starting to get interested now. Now, if we can just get past this goddamn rate rises from the US, yep. ECB, and, and, and central banks, I think we, we, we might just make it yeah. soon. Soon, yeah. I think we're getting close to you know getting past that, hopefully. So, yeah, yeah. yeah I'm, looking for, I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking yeah. forward to it. Now, <laughs> back to the topic, yes. which is Senate. So, um, nickel sulfide indices index yep. um, has been moved to us. Uh, well, it's been, it's been talked about. It is it, how does it work? Yeah. What, are we, what, what should we be, what should we try and understand? Yeah. So that, that was a, a good question that came in a few weeks ago from one of the people who follow mm. uh, this discussion pretty regularly. And so you know, you know, what does it mean for the, the, the market? So you know, again, one of Nickel's biggest challenges has mm. always been a lack of price transparency across the range of products that are mm. out there. And so you know, in, any time you get a chance to have a a transparency point, you know, generally it's a good thing. And yeah. so, you know, sulfate on its own, uh, again, I don't know if it's going to be around forever. It'll be around for a good chunk of time. But right now it's still a, you know, it's a commodity that's, mm. that's bought and sold, you know, in quite a bit of volume. So to have, you know, to have an exchange where people can hedge their exposures, you know, you know, takes uh, any any sort of specific views on it, then then I think that's good for the market. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what, what I wouldn't mind to do is in terms of talking about nickel sulfate versus cobalt sulfate, and this whole, I mean, going back to this class one versus class two. So five or six years ago, I said, you know, people were talking about class one, class two, nickel sulfate was going to trade at a massive premium forever, you know, to the nickel price. And I'm like, no, <laughs> yeah. no, 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 it's not, yeah. you know, and, and we will in another 12, 24 months, you know, all, all, all will be uh, fully revealed and, and things will, quote, get back to normal. And, and the reason I was so confident in that is if you look at the cobalt market, right? Yeah. So nickel and cobalt are next to each other on the periodic table. So, mm -hmm. and generally where they, you know, so they have a lot of similar properties, have to be processed in, in, in generally in similar ways. And we look at the cobalt market, cobalt sulfate trades at a discount to the metal price, mm. right? So again, used in a bunch of high range applications, but why is it always for the last six or seven years traded at a discount? So one of the fundamental properties, and, and again, you don't have to worry about it so much in, in, in the copper and zincs of the world, but in the other part of the periodic table, you know, where there's a, you know, not necessarily a transparent market in terms of how things are processed, you know, one of the, in my view, one of the almost laws of commodities is that, you know, the price of any one product will always trade at the price of the feed plus the average Chinese conversion cost mm. to make that product. Mm. And so what happened in the cobalt market 10 years ago, again, sh you know, shortage of material from the West, the only stuff was available was intermediates from the Congo. So you had this whole processing you know, set up, get built, where they took an intermediate, sort of the equivalent of mat um, mm. you know, or, or hydroxide, similar to what you'd be produced today in nickel. And yeah, they would convert that from that into cobalt sulfate or a range of cobalt salts. And because the cost is low, mm. guess what? And it costs more to convert it to metal than sulfate tra traded at a discount, you know, to the metal price. I'm gonna, you will see the exact same thing happen in nickel. It's already started happening now that the, you know, three years ago, the Chinese used primarily LME metal, spent money to convert it to sulfate, and guess what? Sulfate traded at a premium. Today, in just three years, most of the feed is no longer class one LME deliverable nickel, mm. it's matte and mixed hydroxide from yep. Indonesia. Yep. And guess what? You know, sulfate's traded at a, at a meaningful discount, um, you know, to, to those prices. And, you know, we see that continuing going forward. So the key pieces is, again, in the nickel market, um, is understanding how to deliver a product that's as close to an LME price product as possible, you know, with as little incremental cost. And again, someone who's been in the nickel business for 25 years understands that, you know, 
you know, I, I you know, go better than most people in the market, and again, creates an opportunity. And, and in the discussions we're having, both on the stainless and ferro alloy downstream, and as well on the battery downstream, working with those customers to you know figure out what how to maximize that value. So, again, stay tuned. You'll be you know maybe some more more news coming down the pipe on that front over the next few okay, months here as well. Okay, interesting, interesting. Just on just on copper, so I saw something yep. the other day. I said you know that by by twenty thirty. 41% of copper will be produced as a byproduct, yeah. right? Yeah. So that's a big, that's a big deal, because mm -hmm. obviously it means that hopefully a lot more mines coming on, yeah. uh, 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 mines coming um, online. Um, but what does it, what does it do for people? What do you think it will do for cobalt prices? And you know, if you need that as part of your economics, does that, does that change the thing? Or are we just saying, yeah, sure, but we need a bunch more, so it's fine. So, so, so one of the big fundamental shifts again that people don't really understand, mm. you know, there, you know, there are, there is going to be a lot of mixed hydroxide come from HPAL plants in Indonesia, right? Mm -hmm. Those, those are being built. Those things are coming down the pipe. And again, part of the reason I don't lose any sleep about how much capacity is coming on. Again, we need it all. Yeah. Um, but if for some reason we're going to get into an oversupply situation, the fundamental. Uh, Fundamental, fundamental favor for nickel in that scenario is when you look at what gets produced at your typical HPAL plant, so they produce about one ton of cobalt for every 10 to 15 tons of, of nickel they produce. Mm -hmm. Well, the size of the market is about one ton of cobalt for every 25 to 30 tons uh, of okay. nickel that's consumed. So those new, that new capacity will have a much bigger impact on the cobalt market well before it has, you know, they have any meaningful, you know, impact mm. on the nickel market, and and the way the economics work, you know, with those kind of prices based on historic prices, you know, you're looking at, you know, anywhere from a third to half of the revenue coming from cobalt. Well, if the price of that cobalt drops, and when you have a big amount of byproduct capacity, which is effectively yeah. zero cost, yeah, you know, then you know that can push, you know, look at pushing the cobalt price into the single digits for periods of time. So, you know, which is going to really impact the economics of those, those types of operations. We don't necessarily want to be a, sing, a single cobalt mine. We're certainly thinking about investing in anyone anytime soon. No. I have, think that's my takeaway. That is a very good takeaway. It is, isn't that so clever? <laughs> um, right, we are being baked to death. You know what it's time for? It's time for a nice, cool, refreshing glass of something. Excellent. Thank you for today. Nope. I'm excited to hear about how tomorrow and, and uh, Wednesday um, go for yep. you because it's a big deal. Kind of get these European delegations are, uh, or delegations into Europe is, is, is really important. But at the end of the day, it's, I think it's important so you, you don't get stiffed by the US who'll want everything that you guys can produce. So. Exactly. <laughs> Happy days. Uh, good to see you, man. Good to good see, see you. See you. Thanks, Thanks for having me. Cheers. Guys.